What I'm going to present today uh, is not about the past or anything that has been done at NYU. Uh, this is a model that I've been thinking about for training psychedelic therapists for the future. Uh, sometimes in conversations here, uh, I, I am uh, I've given the question like, what are we going to do? We're going to need so many psychedelic therapists uh, when uh, this medicine is, is uh, un uh, rescheduled. Um, and this, what I'm going to present is one model for how psychedelic therapy, particularly uh, psychodynamic psychedelic therapy, might be brought about. Can we envision a, dynamic, a psychodynamic training program for psychedelic therapists? Um, William James gave us not one, but a varieties of religious experience. Uh, Houston Smith, um, um, Gene Masters and Robert... Robert Masters and Gene Houston, sorry, uh, gave us the varieties of psychedelic experience. And uh, I'm sure that, that most of you will recognize many of the faces that you see here. Uh, these people bring a great variety of psychedelic healing. Um, so there is not one way. This is a group of therapists that uh, I trained at uh, NYU to work on our cancer anxiety program. And they all brought, came from different walks of life. They were all therapists, but we had nurses, social workers, psychologists, uh, and psychiatrists and family therapists. So I'm going to try to, to give a vision for the future of psychodynamic psychedelic therapy. And in this model, the therapist and the patient and the medicine, the spirit of the medicine, are co-creators. Uh, it challenges the model of, of therapist self-effacement of standing back and just being a guide or a monitor in the room and not, not trying to have an influence. It sees the co-creation of the experience as something very much among a triad of the medicine, the therapist, and the patient, and that is central. It looks at unconscious process, both in the patient and in the therapist, and with the medicine and what happens, you know, in that very powerful uh, space, or uh, an, what's called an analytic third. Not the patient, not the analyst, but the third that exists in between the three of them. So I'm going to base, the, you know, the, uh, the training model that I'm envisioning is based on classic psychoanalytic training, and that has three distinct parts didactic coursework, and psychoanalytic training generally occurs over three to five years, sometimes even six or seven years. So it's quite an extended process. It is not something which is, which is efficient, and it's not a way to sort of get people up to speed and get them doing therapy, therapy really quickly. It has very much an arc of transformation, of coming in, being involved in a critical immersion in a process, then ending it, and then and leaving afterwards. So it's not something that you can do you know, in a couple of weekends uh, and then say, okay, I'm, I'm certified and trained. But the three parts of, of analytic training are didactic coursework, carefully supervised control cases, and a personal psychoanalysis. Now, this is the way our, um, our syllabus looked uh, when I did training with a therapist at NYU. Uh, we had articles uh, about uh, human hallucinogen research safety guidelines. But as you can see, we also studied the condition that we were treating. So, for this, we looked at uh, palliative care, how to work with people who are facing end-of-life existential anxiety. Um, but for anybody who thinks that psychoanalytic theory and clinical theory ended in 1939 uh, with Freud's death, I encourage you to uh, read and look at work by these four authors as well as many, many other contemporary writers uh, or writers after Freud. Um, Michael Eigen, Don Stern, Tom Ogden, Wilfred Bion, I could speak for an hour with you about each one of these, but I want to say that each one, rather than having a theory of what the mind is, has a theory of what the, unconscious, about the, uh, the psychoanalytic situation is and does, and how it opens, uh, it's, it's kind of a technology for accessing the ineffable, the unknown, the unexpected, what we don't know. And in, in a way, I realized the best way to describe it in a word is an entropic state, to this place of, of uh, uh, reduced cognitive boundaries and uh, uh, increased emotion. emotion. The, uh, the entropic state really is the best way to describe it. So now we're going to talk about carefully supervised control cases. Um, 
in this case, the, the therapist in training would work, would be responsible for selecting the individuals to work with and preparing them, developing a therapeutic alliance, which contains, but is, it really has quite a bit more in it than, than trust and rapport, which are more of a short-term model for how to have something happen that, that is safe in a, in a short-term way. Uh, a therapeutic alliance has many components and it can be measured for whether it's strong or weak, and it's actually one of the best predictors of outcome. Uh, you would want to learn about the effect of the medicine on the therapy and the therapy on the medicine and look at the reciprocal processes that happen here. Uh, the patient and the doctor or the therapist would be discovering together their shared worldview regarding the nature of the trouble and the nature of the cure. So it isn't something that, um, you know, you can have two worlds coming together, like a Westerner who might go for a, an ayahuasca retreat where they don't even speak the same language. The nature of the problem and the nature of the cure are, and the experience of it, are very much part of the process. The, the, trainee, the trainee would have an experience with a broad variety of cases, may, treating maybe six, eight, or 10, 12 people in a complete course of treatment over the course of, of, of their training. They would treat people with a variety of, of illnesses and problems, people with different character and personality tri types, and also learn to work with trauma. Um, so I think a, a more short-term model for managing the psychedelic therapy session may not have as much experience for the therapist in working with these broad, di broadly distinct types of people. Also, I, I think in this kind of training, you might see a patient that would see that would have a psychedelic session every two months or every three months in the context of an ongoing analytic treatment. So it's very much like the psycholytic model that um, uh, Loiner wrote about and is still very much practiced in an underground model today. There will be attention to transference and countertransference, and in particular attention to ruptures in treatment uh, where things go wrong and they aren't really feeling so great for everyone, as well as termination. And the third category, or the, the third part of analytic training, uh, would be the personal psychoanalysis. And in this, the therapist would select and work with a senior psychedelic therapist who would work with that trainee in the manner in which the trainee is training. So in this model, uh, somebody who's going to uh, Santo Daime ceremonies or shamanic ceremonies would not really be practicing uh, psychedelic therapy of the kind that they were trying to learn to practice. If you uh, study in a shamanic setting and you go a couple of hundred times, you're learning to be a shaman. You may be in an apprenticeship to become a shaman, learning that worldview, learning that way of understanding the human condition. Uh, likewise, if you're in a Santo Daime and you become very devoted, you may become a Furdado or a Mestre in your particular uh, way of working. So in this model, the trainee would be working with a therapist who practices in quite the same way, a psychodynamically oriented psychedelic um, process. What's important about this is over the long time, the uh, comfortable idealization that you often see at the beginning of a treatment reveals some of the darker sides of human nature with identification and idealization, then competitiveness, devaluation, envy, all these uh, uh, aspects of human character that come out when you know, work progresses over long periods of time. And you see this clearly in shamanic training where you learn about brujeria and uh, a shaman that might be selling his services to uh, somebody for, for an evil intention. You learn how to see it, you learn how to name it, um, and you learn how to uh, uh, you know, steer clear of it because it can be seductive and inviting. Also, in any kind of analytic, uh, uh, what's called a training analysis, you're, you're with your analyst for four years or five years, and eventually uh, your work ends and you go through a termination process, and it is after that that you become a fully, full-fledged, mature, autonomous, practicing psychoanalyst, and then it becomes your turn to work with other trainees. So this process of having an illness, going to a treatment process where, you're, where you are healed in it, and then becoming a healer is you know, a long developmental process that happens over a number of years, ending in separation and autonomy. So, uh, if, that, if that were not complicated and long-winded enough, uh, there's some other interesting questions that come up about a, a project like this. Would it be only with one particular psychedelic medicine would you have an iboga uh, therapist training program or psilocybin or ayahuasca? 
Is training specific to a particular type of problem? Do you train only to do uh, life-threatening illness, addiction, or PTSD, or is intensive psychodynamic, psychedelic therapy, um, you know, a particular kind of work that a person would learn to do to the exclusion of other kinds of, uh, of treatment? Uh, what does the training process ultimately exert in terms, uh, have to do in terms of exerting judgment? And the disc discrimination to say, you're doing well, you're not doing so well, I think that you need to work in this area, and and uh, we want you to come on our, our faculty and, and become a teacher here. These are very difficult things to say in psychoanalytic training, and yet I think if you're going to train therapists, you have to be open to the fact that not everybody that goes through it is going to be practicing it equally well. And lastly, what do we as thoughtful clinicians and researchers and educators need to do to prepare clinicians for a post-rescheduling world? And what is our responsibility in terms of uh, creating programs, not just that are efficient and rapid in getting therapists on board, which is, is kind of the model that we use in, in, in research, uh, but when we look at, at, at the, the world in a post-scheduling post world, what is, our, what is our greatest vision for how we can train therapists that are safe and effective and bring the most to their to their day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, profession? So, thank you. Okay.